thank you for coming out this evening. I hope that you've been enjoying our fabulous um, bar in the back. A lounge lounge. If anyone wants to start singing later, we'll call it we'll ready to go. Um, First, I'd like to thank the friends, obviously, for um, always supporting and volunteering and organizing our events. I have to do a special thank you tonight to our planning committee in the back who put so much time, energy, creativity, and a lot of laughing into putting this together. So please, please give them a round of So tonight, I am happy to introduce Delia Cave. She is a North Reading resident, and I want to say a new North Reading resident. She has been here for three years. Um, and let me just give you a little background. Delia grew up in New York City on Manhattan's Lower East Side. She is a magazine writer and a bookworm. We have a lot in common with most of us. Yes. <laughs> Her work has appeared in Self, Prevention, Health, Boston Globe Magazine, Boston Magazine, Scientific American Presents, and other newspapers and magazines. Delia teaches magazine and column writing at Emerson College, and tonight she is here to talk about her new book, Story Bars of New York. So please welcome Delia Cave. Thank you very much. I um, it's really a pleasure to see. I, I love the um, the effort that went into the the back table. It's just so lovely, and I love all the, the fun we had with book titles. It just pleases this bookworm's heart. And um, I'm seeing many people who I've never seen before, and then I've seen some of my neighbors here, and I'm really uh, happy to see them here. It's really exciting. And and thanks to uh, Dick Haley for sell, selling books here, too, because I've seen him on, at other occasions, because I'm a frequenter of readings all over the greater Boston area. So what I'd like to what I'd like to do first is on your chairs there's a little form to fill out. I'm raffling off these um, these uh, cocktail shakers. So if you would, there's there's pens on one pen in each row. If you could fill them out and I'll pass this bag around and you can um, you can uh, and I'll do it at the end. So I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library for putting together this event and having such a great reading series here. I'd like to thank uh, Candia, uh, who um, interviewed me for the North Reading transcript. It was a delight to be on the other side of the being interviewed rather than interviewing somebody. And I'd also like to thank Mr. G, um, who, <laughs> who uh, happened to be walking a neighbor's dog, it wasn't your dog. Uh, and when he found out that I had just written a book, he said, I have to do this. So, because of him, I'm here. So, you can either blame him or like him later. <laughs> so, I'm going to open up with a couple of talks from my book. My book has recipes in them for most of the bars, except for the bars that don't serve cocktails. And if you have a favorite author, whether it's Zelda Fitzgerald or Walt Whitman or Dorothy Parker, uh, or even someone who's more recently like Jay McInerney, the recipes are in here. So you can have quite a party while you're reading. I grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. A lifelong bookworm, I would often walk the streets of New York City, imagining the many authors who had lived and written in the apartments I passed. My grade school on Christopher Street in Greenwich Village was located one block from the Lion's Head, a celebrated watering hole for writers and journalists. I knew that E.E. E. Cummings, Don Powell, Thomas Paine, and Ted White had all lived on Christopher Street at one time or another. Dorothy Parker and I went to the same Catholic school in the same double brownstone on West 79th Street in Manhattan, separated by numerous decades. <laughs> Unlike the class troublemaker Dottie, I thrived in that brownstone with its dark wood touches and a layout that I could imagine being someone's home. Had I been of legal age, I would have toasted Dorothy's ghost in my classroom with a tall glass of gin. Unfortunately, the only alcohol allowed was the red wine served at communion during mass in the first floor chapel. It was also an all-girls school. It was very small. Okay. My book, my book is, is about how the whole 
re writers and readers got involved in bar culture. And it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have happened without uh, the likes of Walt Whitman and a bar called Crafts. The story of the love affair between writers and New York's bars, taverns, pubs, and speakeasies begins in Lower Manhattan in a 19th century saloon. While the bar no longer exists, it holds a pivotal place in the annals of literary history, and of course, drinking. Charles Ignatius Pfaff, a kind-hearted, rotund man of German-Swiss descent with short, stiff hair, arrived in New York with dreams of owning a Ratzkeller, the German word for a tavern or bar located in a basement. Sometime in the late 1850s, he opened Pfaff's, which he advertised as a restaurant and large beer saloon in the basement of a fine hotel near the corner of Bleecker Street on the southeastern edge of what is now New York University. His subterranean establishment in the heart of New York's then theater district and about a mile from Newspaper Row, where all city newspapers had offices, caught the eye of Henry Clapp Jr. Henry Clapp had this little uh, competition with, with someone with Boston roots. A Massachusetts native, Clapp found, founded the literary journal Saturday Review, a countercultural publication in 1858 in Fass. His newspaper advertised as, quote, a weekly journal of literary, artistic, dramatic, and music intelligence was considered New York's answer to the Atlantic Monthly, a literary magazine started in Boston the year before. The newspaper was akin to the alternative weeklies found in urban areas today. So I just heard the village voice is no longer going to be in print anymore. Before Clapp settled in Manhattan, he had lived for a few years in France, where he had become smitten with the life of Bohemians in Paris. Unlike members of the upper class who held intellectual conversations in proper salons, these outcast artists and writers carried on their discussions in watering holes while swilling absinthe. Bohemians disdain bourgeois life, preferring a rakish existence marked by free thinking. Since Clapp's return to America, he had been looking to establish a bit of Bohemia in New York, and Fass, in its prime location, had the right atmosphere. Fass ordered, offered excellent Rhine wines, liquor, German-style lager, and German pancakes, beefsteak, cheese, and other edibles served on fine china with genuine silver flatware. The saloon, one of the few that welcomed women, was by no means genteel. Rough and tumble laborers, firemen, actors from nearby playhouses, newspaper men, and others filled its tables. In this plain and quaint place, Clapp could realize his bohemian dream. He selected from his circle of literary friends, many of whom wrote for his own publication, as well as essayists, critics, journalists, playwrights, poets, actors, and artists to join him for conversation and drink. At the small tables, these working writers and artists could sit for hours imbibing alcohol or coffee in the gaslit, smoke-filled basement, its floors covered with sawdust. In 1859, Walt Whitman joined the group, traveling by ferry from his Brooklyn home. He was 39 years old, a soon-to-be-out-of-work newspaper man, with a book of poetry called Leaves of Grass, written in non-traditional verse. His book was not selling well. Within a short period, Whitman was part of the inner circle and a habitué. Quote, I used to go to Fass every night, the good gray poet told a reporter for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in 1866. It used to be a pleasant place to go in the evening after taking a bath and finishing a day of work. Whitman disliked Pfaff, the saloon keeper, the first time they met. Quote, but my subsequent acquaintance with him taught me not to be too hasty in making my mind up about people on first sight. He was always kind to beggars and gave them food freely. Then he was easily moved to sympathize with anyone who was in trouble and was generous with his money. I believed he was, at the time, the ju best judge of wine of anybody in this country. One of the things that I found out a couple of places allowed writers to run up bar tabs. And in some cases, in one case, the person who wrote um, Forrest Gump, 
he ran up a several thousand dollar uh, tab at one of the restaurants in New York that was home to many writers. And when he got, he sold his book, he, and, and, and his book was made into a movie, he went and paid, he went over and paid several, his several thousand dollar tab at Elaine's, which is another chapter in this book. Um, okay, next I'm going to read about um, 21. 21 Club is this one right here. Um, and it's on, 50, it's on 52nd Street, and if 21, the 21 Club will teach you how to run your own speakeasy and keep away the feds, so listen closely. <laughs> Write what you know may be cliche advice, but authors nevertheless like to set scenes from their novels in their favorite drinking haunts. In the opening of Dashiell Hammett's The Thin Man, Nick awaits his wife, Nora, at a speakeasy on West 52nd Street. He orders scotch and sodas at the bar, one for himself and one for a woman in the mystery. Although about 38 speakeasies lined that block, Nick and Nora fans like to believe that Hammett had 21 in mind. Hammett himself would drop in for drinks with his buddy William Faulkner in 1931, two years before The Thin Man was published. Nearly two decades later, long after 21 speakeasy days, Truman Capote had come to favor the bar. Around the time he began his brief stint as a copy boy for The New Yorker in the early 1940s, Capote also started having 21's meals delivered to his apartment. In Breakfast at Tiffany's, his narrator spots Holly Golightly at a table with four men. Her yawning along with, with her combing her hair at the table, the narrator says, put a dampener on the excitement I felt over dining at so swanky a place. The 21 has been the darling of the literary world ever since its days in Greenwich Village. The secret to its early success as a speakeasy involved relocating often, renaming the bar with each move so as to keep ahead of the federal agents, and getting in on the good side of each new location's police department. The owners went one step further. Bathtub, bathtub gin was verboten. Only excellent food and high quality liquor, wine, and champagne from trusted bootleggers could be served. And perhaps one of those bootleggers was a certain Kennedy. In the early days of Prohibition, two cousins, Jack Kreenler from the Lower East Side and Charles Burns of the Upper West Side, ditched their college studies to open a speak. They hoped to fund their education with the profits. Charlie had misgivings about their entrepreneurial venture, and if my students ever said that this is what they were planning to do to fund their, their schooling, I'd question them too. <laughs> Jack, meanwhile, drew in a partner, Edward Irving, and persuaded friends and family to invest in their enterprise. In 1922, they found a spot on 6th Avenue and West 4th Street, near when I, where I went to grade school, and named it The Redhead. The speakeasy was disguised as a tea room with liquor served in teacups. They kept gangsters away from their popular speak, and with a little moolah, enlisted police protection. At that point, Charlie rejoined the business. Because Jack envisioned a classier joint, they moved to 88 Washington Place on the corner of 6th Avenue after greasing the palms of another police precinct. They called it Fronton, the decor, the decor of which was a step up from the redhead's divey atmosphere. To keep out the riffraff, the front door had a peephole so that patrons could be screened. If federal agents, or as they were called, booze busters, paid them a visit, someone would ring a buzzer to warn that a raid was in a, in a, imminent. Patrons were instructed, bottoms up. After gulping down their gin, rye, <coughs> bourbon, or scotch, they sprinted out a back door. All alcohol would be tossed down the drain. The feds would look around and see no alcohol. The stench of alcohol was not enough for the feds to bring criminal charges. Edna St. Peter Simolay, who lived in Branch Village, and Dorothy Parker went there for drinks, as did James Jimmy Walker, mayor of New York. Flappers and college students joined in the merriment. A planned subway line forced 21 to find new digs again. In 1926, eyeing the many well-to-do people who were taking up residence in midtown Manhattan, the owners found a Tony townhouse property with an ornamental iron gate, there it is, located at 42 West 49th Street. This time their speak was called the Punchins Grotto. 
people, including the owners, refer to it as the Punchin, the Grotto, or Jack and Charlie's. They hoped to attract an upscale clientele, a place where men of letters of wealth could bring their wives or dates. Jack wanted to create a comfortable atmosphere where people could linger, talk, or read the newspaper. Plans for Rockefeller Center in 1930 put the kibosh on this spot. On New Year's Eve, 1929, the owners held a demolition party, serving mint juleps made with gin and planter's punch. The carousers, eventually among them, wielding sledgehammers, pickaxes, crowbars, and other ersatz tools, tore down walls, broke up flooring, and otherwise reduced the place to rubble. They proved Robert Benchley's witticism, drinking makes such fools of people, and people are such fools to begin with, that it's compounding a felony. The demolition done, a policeman joined in the mirth and rode his horse through the debris. They carried dinnerware, chairs, cookware, and even the iron gate to their final and current location, 21 West 52nd Street that night. Lunch was served at the new address on the first day of 1930. Although the two of the moves were due to circumstances beyond their control, the frequent name changes ensured that the bar would leave no money trail behind, which helped its owners to elude the feds. At the new location, gangsters and the police left them untouched, except for once. Gossip columnist Walter Winchell was miffed that he was persona non grata at this watering hole. The speakeasy with its numerous journalists, editors, publicists, writers, and Broadway and movie stars would have provided much fodder for his columns. In 1932, Winchell sought revenge in ink. In his column, he was asked why 21 had never been raided by the feds. They turned up the next day, but the warrant they brought with them was flawed, and as a result, the feds could do little but, then, but give them a mild reprimand. Fearing that they wouldn't be as lucky the second time around, the owners sought out an architect to, to design several means to foil the feds. They devised an elaborate security system that entailed false staircases and walls, secret alarms, bar shelves that would collapse at the push of a button, dumping all the bottles through a chute where they'd shatter, and a camouflage vault in the cellar that could be opened only by inserting a spaghetti-thin wire into a hard-to-find hole. Once the wire completed the electrical circuit, the door could be pushed open. The vault door was disguised with brick to match the, sur the surrounding wall, which made it heavy. And I'm going to try this and see. Okay, so this is the, this is the entrance to um, 21. And that's, that's the wall. So they keep that little iron, and, and that is actual brick that they've painted over. So that opens up to this. <laughs> During Prohibition, Mayor Jimmy Walker had a private booth in the basement vault. That was his booth. With a personal telephone line to receive calls from municipal offices. They knew where to find him. The ruses extended to their bootleggers, one of whom delivered his goods in a hearse. Others stashed bottles of booze under car fenders. Their, effort turned, their efforts turned out to be unnecessary. 21 was never subject to another raid. Jack, who was fascinated with the Old West, often greeted guests such as F. Scott Fitzgerald in Western Guard. H.L. Menke, Menke may have wanted nothing to do with the members of the round table while staying at the Algonquin, but he didn't mind running into them at 21, his blot of choice when he was in town. He did, however, prefer to sit with others. Um, one of the things, the fun thing about looking around that cellar is there are labels on those bottles from people like Jackie Kennedy, Richard Nixon, Ivan Boski, um, Chelsea Clinton, someone who'd given her an expensive bottle of wine uh, for her 21st birthday. Um, I'm trying to remember who else. I think there's Peter Benchley. Um, because whenever they would come into town, they would keep their expensive favorite wines down there. And there's also bottles dating from the Prohibition down there. Um, so uh, the, their estates still own that wine. So if you're, I guess, Julie Nixon Eisenhower, you would go down there. And you would say, you could say I'd like a, a bottle of Dad's favorite wine or whatever. Over the years, the dining area, bar, and lounge, and wine cellar vault acquired unique characteristics. 
Unlike restaurant chains with faux scratchy antique trinkets and faded signs, 21 came by its collection honestly. The walls are crammed with New Yorker cartoons and photos of famous patrons accumulated over the years. In the main room, memorabilia gifted to the bar by patrons dangles from the ceiling. Model airplanes and trucks, Dorothy Hamill's ice skates, a Julia Child cookbook, Willie Mays' baseball bat, George Plimpton's book of interviews of Truman Capote's friends, lovers, and colleagues. Given Jack's predilection for all things Western, Remington sculptures and paintings are mounted throughout. The outside of the building stands out too. Since the 30s, 21 has catered to the horsey set, who donated colorful miniature cast iron lawn jockeys, denoting the colors of their respective horse farms. Now there are about 34 of those jockeys. The most recent one is the belonging to American, the, the stables that uh, brought up uh, American Pharaoh, who won the Triple Crown in 2015. Author anecdotes involving this celebrated watering hole are plentiful. It is here that Benchley is said to have uttered one rainy night, get me out of this coat and into a wet martini. <laughs> Seeing Ernest Hemingway arrive, the bartender would prepare a papa doble, a double daiquiri consisting of white rum, juice of two limes, and half a grapefruit, and six maraschino cherries. The papa doble was created for Hemingway by a bartender in Cuba. Papa Hemingway sometimes would shake his head no and tell the bartender, since I'm not drinking, I'll just have a tequila. <laughs> um, see, Other authors and journalists who got by the, those iron gates for a place at tables shrouded in red checkered tablecloths were Lillian Hellman, who was romantically involved with Dashiell Hammett, Harold Ross, Sinclair Lewis, Somerset Maugham, H.G. Wells, Edward R. Murrow, Studs Terkel, Peter Benchley, who's the son of Robert Benchley, whom I mentioned earlier, Brendan Gill, John Updike, and Helen Gurley Brown. Ludwig Bemelman's author and illustrator of the Madeline Children's Book wrote in a letter, I would like to be buried in 21 cellar with the cream litter standing by in dark suits, each holding a burning candle in one hand and in the other my large bills. <laughs> when Benchley died in 1945, Robert Benchley that is, the bar held a memorial for him. A bronze plaque marks Benchley's preferred corner booth. The wine cellar is a liquid archive of prohibition itself. Dusty bottles of gin dating to prohibition fill the shelves. Next to the private wine club collections of Nelson Doubleday, Doubleday, the publisher, and Sidney Sheldon, the author of steamy bestsellers, as well as US presidents, movie stars, and directors, plus two business tycoons who served time in federal penitentiary centuries. Now, if you can also, if you so wish, you can also do a party down there. You can have a private party down there. They have a big, big wooden table that was, has um, the 21 Club in marquetry inside it. So what I'm going to do is show you some more pictures of other bars I featured in um, my book. There's altogether, there's about almost 35 bars. Okay, this is McSorley's. It's one of the oldest bars in, in um, New York. It's, um, if I walk away from the microphone, can you hear me? So, yes. Okay. Anyway, it's known for its, they only have two kinds of beer that they serve you, and they serve it to you in two six-ounce six mugs. They have dark beer and light beer, and you can get a plate of, of, of cheese and crackers and onions and um, the place, the walls are, are filled with, like, uh, all these authors and their books. Um, this this was celebrated. This this bar was celebrated by Joseph Mitchell, who wrote for the New Yorker. Um, and uh, there are Abraham Lincoln also uh, drank there, but that was before he was president. This is the Algonquin, the famous Algonquin of the Round Table. Uh, uh, it was owned by Frank Case initially. There is the. The, a picture of the round table that's in the oak room. I have two recipes in my book for the, uh, Dorothy Parker drinks because it seems appropriate that a book about authors would have two Dorothy Parker drinks. No, she didn't start. She didn't start drinking until um, Prohibition set, and Prohibition turned a lot of people who were teetotalers into drinkers. <laughs> um, and there were there in New York at the time before Prohibition, there was something like fifteen thousand saloons and bars and pubs, 
in, during Prohibition, it went up to about 32,000, 36,000. <laughs> so it worked really well. <laughs> this is the blue, the blue room bar, the blue bar in the Algonquin Hotel. Uh, John Barrymore, who is related to who's Drew Barrymore's, I think, great granddaughter or somebody. Um, uh, I think is her, is her, is Drew Barrymore, the actress, is great to granddaughter. The bar had closed before Prohibition because Frank Case was raising his children there, and there were people who um, were started arriving at 5 o'clock for drinks, and they would hang out in the hotel lobby until late in the evening. Then they moved the time till about 3 o'clock. Then they started showing up around 12 o'clock, the same group of people. And then they were showing up, you know, just after breakfast. And Frank Case said, no, I don't want this going on in my bar. I've got my children here, my family's here. So he closed the bar, and then after pro about uh, a few years after Prohibition, Frank Case was losing a lot of business to other um, other uh, hotels and bars. People would like they they would go out to a place where they can have drinks with their dinner. So John Barrymore recommended when he decided to reopen his bar to put in blue light because that's what they use on stage lighting, and that makes everyone look good. So um, and they have a really delicious. Okay, this is um, Bemelman's in the Hotel Carlisle in the, on the Upper East Side. Um, some of you, if you've read Madeline or read Madeline's Rescue to Your Children, this, the mural was done by Ludwig Bemelman. To pay for his uh, stay there, he agreed to do the, do the, um, uh, the uh, excuse me, do the mural for, for them. It's a very sweet place. It's very cozy. They have a piano there. You know, sometimes you might see someone like Billy Joel drop in and sing a few songs. So, it's it, it's it's a very darling darling place. Truman Capote also liked that place, as did uh, Jackie Onassis when she was working as an editor at a publisher in New York. This is Chumley's. This is this was closed for a few years. This was also a speakeasy. Um, it's, it's, its facade is a, a, a National Historic Landmark. Um, it reopened back in, no, in uh, November of last year. Uh, and it was, it's supposedly because it's, it's at 86 Bedford Street and to 86 someone, there's supposedly, but mo no, ling no uh, linguist can figure it out, but, um, supposedly to that, that phrase originated with, um, with Chumley's. But inside, all, all the, as authors kept on hanging out there, like Simone de Beauvoir, um, uh, let's see, who else? Oh gosh, I'm forgetting who else. I have a whole list of this. But anyway, um, they kept all the photographs, uh, because it became a dive for, uh, for a while, they kept all the photographs in there of the, the original book covers, and it's, it's really beautiful. Hold on, just bear with me. Put on my reading glasses. Okay. Um, I can tell you. Let's see. Okay. So John Dos Passos, Theodore Dreiser, E. E. Cummings, James A. G. John Berryman, Berryman, Willa Cather, John Cheever. Um, all the beats. Oh, the beats went to several bars in, in my book. Um, Allen Ginsberg, Erica Jong, uh, Albert K Kaysen, John F. Kennedy, um, Norman Mailer, Dylan Thomas, James Thurber, Anais Nin, Marion Moore, Margaret Mead, Frank McCourt. Wow. A lot of them went there. So it was very, I mean, the list is quite extensive. Um, that's the interior. Sorry I couldn't get make this bigger, but all those are pictures of authors. And all around here, oh, wait. Um, yes. All along here, this is the first time I've used this, <laughs> except with my cats. Um, <laughs> all along here are, are book covers of authors who used to frequent there. Kettle of Fish. Kettle of Fish started out with um, started out in, in another location, and this was the original location of Lion's Head. Over the years, the owner of the of of the Kettle of Fish had to move his bar, so he moved into Lion's Head. This is right on Christopher Street, one block from where I went to grade school. It, too, was a big place where the beats went. Um, if you've seen, there's an iconic photograph of Jack Kerouac, and he's standing next to that bar sign. It used to be outside at the Kettle, the kettle of Fish. 
This is Minetta's, also another frequent, frequent place for the, the, the beats. And if any of you read um, or seen the movie about uh, Joe Gould, who was Professor Siegel, um, he used, he was, he, they, to, they made him sort of the official beatnik. And so he was parked at a table in the front so he could um, uh, attract tourists. And it was like, he was like the token beatnik. <laughs> um, and he was he he he, he had his own s story, but um, right today nowadays you can go see you see people like Anna Wintour, the the book editor of Vogue, Jay McInerney, and a, and a few others. Sometimes Graydon Carter, who's at the um, of, um, Vanity Fair magazine. This is the White Horse Tavern. This is where Dylan Thomas had his last drinks, and this is the Dylan Thomas room. And all around the whole room is where he um, uh, is all Dylan Thomas memorabilia. Um, and now it's like uh, someone once said that every English major on the Northeast Corridor goes to see Dylan, goes to this room when they go to New York. But he had his last drinks. He was very sick. He was, it was a few days after his birthday. He went back to the Hotel Chelsea where he was uh, um, also mentioned in his book. And I described his, his demise. In my book, he he uh, uh, he used to hold forth, recite poetry. Um, so, the Monkey Bar. This bar is owned by Graydon Carter, who's the soon not to be the editor of, of um, Vanity Fair. It too has. This is Tennessee Williams died upstairs from it. So one of the lovely things about the Monkey Bar, and it, and there are three stories behind why it's called the Monkey Bar. None of, no one knows which one is the origins of it. And it's attached to the Hotel Elysee. Um, the monkey bar has all monkeys all around. All the lamps are little monkeys, big monkeys. The mural has monkeys you know, playing cards, monkeys in the jungle. Um, and then it has this, this gorgeous mural all along the back. And this is Tennessee Williams right here. Um, but it has all these jazz greats, uh, Broadway greats, you know, lyricists and writers, Dorothy Parker's on there too. And as my final shot, uh, the last recipe in here is called The Last Word. It was by coincidence that it was the last recipe because the woman I interviewed for this bar in Long Island City, that was her favorite drink and so, um, so I included it in here and so that's, that's how it ends. And if you can see over here, Dorothy Parker Gin. Dorothy Parker did not, did not like gin. She was actually more of a scotch person that she sipped on all day. But this, this place called The Shanty, which I also include, a distillery in Brooklyn, um, uh, uh, makes Dorothy Parker gin. And so that's, that's the way there's also that they have their own Dorothy Parker recipe. So they have um, a gin to celebrate her. And the bottle's really neat because if you look in the back, there's a silhouette of Dorothy Parker in the back. But, um, so that's it. And I'd like to open it for questions. And the, yes? Do you think um, the, the internet and the ability to communicate electronically is changing the way bars are gathering places for writers because they can communicate other ways? Or are they just as much of a gathering place as ever? It's funny you should say that because I met my agent through Twitter, um, and I met all these writer friends through Twitter and, and social media. However, um, in my book, I also included bars that are fairly new. Um, they're not the because I didn't want to just include just the old standbys, the Algonquin, the White Horse Tavern, etc. I um, included bars that have very robust reading series now. So there's a there in Brooklyn. Brooklyn has become the new new place for all these writers. So they hang out at, at Franklin, Franklin Park, which has a read, uh, an extensive reading series. 61 Local, which also has uh, people, uh, friends of mine uh, who are authors, they work there during the day, have coffee or whatever, and then they hang out at night listening to music or whatever they have there. And um, the Brooklyn Poets Society, they have a, a monthly workshop there. Um, Pete's Candy Store, uh, which used to be a candy store, also in, also in Brooklyn, also it was right around the corner from where they make Dorothy Parker gin. They also have um, a, um, uh, a a reading series. Some of it is participatory. So they writers, I think, 
being by our nature, we're all you know sitting at home alone, writing all day. We need our we need our other office, and it can it's either coffee, you know, during the day, or maybe after you've written your your certain number of, of words that day that that was your goal, you would go to the go to a bar. And then there's also Bo's restaurant, which is owned by um, Andrew Young, the civil rights activist. His son owns Bo's. He's Andrew Young the third, I think. And his name is Bose, and it's a New Orleans-style restaurant. Mm -hmm. And every month they too have a, a literary series. They have reading, so it's 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 a nice mix. So I think I saw a hand over here. Oh, okay. Have yes. you found any in Boston? Oh well, where I hang out, or yeah. well, <laughs> <laughs> and writer friends. Well, we all go to Kitty's, don't we? Oh, definitely. <laughs> 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 No, we, um, there's, uh, in downtown Boston, there's a place called Yvonne's, which, it's, door, it's where Lock Over used to be, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's hidden, the doorway. So when you go through, you think you've walked through a, like a, a hairdresser's place, but back in, it's, it's, shaped, it's made like a, a library. It's, 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 the whole place is like someone's fancy library with letters, seating and everything mm -hmm. like that. But um, I also like at the Liberty Hotel that the way they have their bar set up in the in the reception area, so and the W. So I I, I like to um, uh, squat at you know be a squatter at at, at nice hotels, mm -hmm. you know. So if it has a fireplace, it, the Ritz is around the corner from my school, so from Emerson. So I go there. They have a fireplace, and I sit there with my coffee and I grade stuff or read. So yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, um, I don't know where, where Sebastian Younger goes anymore but up here. He no longer drinks, actually, but he grew up in Belmont. But he, op he and that bar is included in, in my um, book, too, that, The Half King. He opened a bar because he wanted a place for writers to hang out, journalists, because he liked when he was overseas doing, you know, reporting in war zones. He went out to, um, he enjoyed... He wanted a place where, after the, a day, you could just sit there and hang out with your journalist friends, just like Hemingway used to do in the Spanish Civil War and stuff. So. Yes? What was your inspiration to write this book? Oh, that's a good question. I originally wanted to write a book about bars that look like libraries. So the book was the, it was the working title. It was called uh, Cocktails at the Library. So about five years ago, my, my, my agent sent it around right when there was a, a trend for a, a peak trend for cocktail books. And she had hit it, we had hit it just at when the trend was dying out a little bit. And then a year, a year and a half ago in April, she said she noticed another uptick in interest by publishers. So she sent my proposal out again. And um, the, this division of Norton um, came back and said, we like our writing. We like we like this sort of, but we should do one in um, uh, about literary bars in New York. And I convinced my husband Rob, who's back there, um, that night that I wasn't going to do it because I was going to write a book about gardening. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, so I and so he said, okay, you know, whatever you decide is fine with me. And so the next morning I realized it was a no-brainer. I grew up in New York City. I've been keeping track of, you know, I re, I'm steeped in history of New York. I'm steeped in literary history of New York and where authors lived and all that. And so I decided to do it. So that's, that's how it came about. So, yes? Do you have a favorite of the 34 places that you have listed? This is like asking you if you have a favorite child, but you only have one child, so <laughs> you're lucky. You know, I like all of them. Bevelman's is probably my favorite because it's cozy and it's romantic and it's sweet. Uh, but uh, I, I, each one of them has a certain characteristic. Like, for example, Pete's Tavern is where O. Henry um, uh, wrote supposedly The Gift of the Magi. And, um, and uh, Madeline, uh, the Be love with Be Bevelman, wrote on the back of a napkin that outlined the Madeline's rest, you know, the Madeline series of books, and started drawing them there. So each one of them, they just have a different meaning to, to me. So, and of course, the Algonquin. I mean, you know, that's like, uh, you know, that's where the New Yorker magazine got started and stuff. So they're all, uh, they're all, they all have their specialness. I mean. 
for drains, I would I wouldn't necessarily say you know like the higher end place like Bemelman's and stuff like that go there for the cocktails. The other place go there for the atmosphere, not necessarily the drinks. Like like the the um, White Horse Tavern, I wouldn't go there for cocktails. You know, don't tell them. But <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, I would just go there for the atmosphere. Yes. Do you have plans for another book? Yes, I do. It's sitting on my editor's uh, table. My agent liked my proposal, but I can't say what it is yet. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's about New York. Mm -hmm. So, another aspect of New York. So, any other questions? Yes, Kevia. I'm interested in how, I mean, have you sold a lot of books? And, and um, have you? Well, how, how are people receiving the book? Ah, well, the North Reading transcript covered it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I, I, I tend to think I'm doing well-ish because my publisher wants me to write another book. They asked me before I even proposed another book project to them, so they, they seem happy with it. Um, and I've gotten a lot of coverage on my first day back in... Uh, on one of my first trips back to New York City, on the, my book was published in June, and my first week there, on the day of publication, I came into Penn Station, and the one of the New York papers had my book on the cover, oh, so I was oh. very, I was thrilled. Mm -hmm. um, and Condé Nast Traveler has covered it, so it's been it's been covered, you know, nicely, and um, and uh, and the funny thing is now on Amazon. They, they use the service called BookScan, which I guess keeps track of books in the thing. So, and on Amazon, I've been, I've been in travel books on the Northeast in that it's, it's particular area. It's been in the 200 or higher regularly. So, and sometimes it's been in the top 50. So that, I'm thinking that that's what, that, that must be doing well. Have you had any author events in New York? Yes, yes, I had um, six. Six? No. Well, I had one at Pete's Tavern. I had one in Long Island. Um, 61 Local in Brooklyn. Um, what? Hoboken. What? Hoboken. Oh, yes, in Hoboken, New Jersey, <laughs> where Frank Sinatra's from. Thank you. <laughs> um, Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, and I, I might be having one at another one of the, this, this uh, recently re renovated hotel where um, John Steinbeck and uh, Hemingway used to stay and Zelda Fitzgerald, they, they're planning to have one. And, and in fact, I have the recipe for, her. they have a drink called the Zelda. Mm -hmm. And that recipe is in there, it's kind of spicy. And they also, you can also get a version of the Zelda delivered to your room at the hotel for something like a hundred dollars. <laughs> also, at the Algonquin, you can get if you if you decide to to uh, propose to someone, they can work with you with a with a with a jeweler and to have the a, a diamond set in a in a in a in an engagement ring, and they put it inside a martini and they serve it, and it's ten thousand dollars. <laughs> so. So, you know, you can drop your own wedding bands and your, 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 your engagement rings and your own drink and so, 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 just make sure they don't swallow it. <laughs> but, yeah. Anything else? Anyone else? Yes. Was it, was it hard to um, cut it down to 35 or did you, I, I mean, there were places that I could, you know, that one could think of where, where there were literary types gathered and they were, yes. kind, of, they were kind of like, they weren't necessarily specifically bars, but I mean, for example, like Studio 54, where we right. be, uh, you know, attract a lot of literary types. Did you used they... to go to Studio 54 a lot? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what happened was we wanted to keep the make the book as contemporary as possible. So there were lots of bars that are no longer in existence that were were very. There's only two bars in the book that don't exist anymore. One is fast. The other one is the San Remo. Um, San Remo is also another hangout in, uh, uh, with the Beats in the village. Um, and um, but we decided that we wanted to keep it to bars that were open. I wanted. I originally had a chapter for the West End Cafe near Columbia University, um, and that's where the Beats uh, first met. And they. Uh, Kerouac, Willamus Burroughs, Lucien Carr, who's Caleb Carr's father, uh, or was, and um, 
uh, who am I leaving out? Laser Allen Ginsberg. They that's where they first started hanging out and started talking about this philosophy that came to be known as the Beats. Um, and uh, um, but that and and then like years later, Barack Obama used to hang hang out there and other writers from Columbia University, but it has since it closed a whole bunch of years ago. So we decided to, rather than have bars that had already been closed, we decided we wanted things that, places that were still open so that you can go there and toast your favorite author mm -hmm. or literary type. So, um, so yes, there's about 30, 35, but there were, I originally, I had a list of about 50 originally. So, and it was hard cutting out the West End Cafe because there was a murder there. You know, what book doesn't need a murder? <laughs> you know, where, where Jack Kerouac and William and Burroughs end up in jail overnight as accessories to it. So, it's pretty cool. Yes? I don't know what you mean by the Beats. Oh, okay, the Beats were a group of, 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 um, of, uh, of writers. They wrote, um, they, they were called the Beat Generation. They wore the, the, the they were bohemian. So they were the Beats. Yes, the beatniks. Okay, the yes, beatniks, that I knew. Yeah. Okay, okay, yes, 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 right. yes, yes. So, is a, yes, so yes. Um, to your knowledge, is there a walking tour to all these different places, all these different bars, or do you want to do one yourself? My husband keeps on telling me I need to do that. Because whenever we, my husband and I are both from New York, except we met in Belmont at a Starbucks. <laughs> so we, we, we kept, we, he keeps on, whenever we go down to New York, I'm walking around and I'm, I'm telling him, oh, on this block this happened, on that block this happened. So he keeps on thinking that I should get a bullhorn and just yeah, go down yeah. there and start doing tours. Mm -hmm. So. And he's still there waiting. Yes, yes, yes. I can see have a big audience for that. Yeah, maybe we could get a bus from North Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> you could also train some people to do it and sample it. Just wow, we've got a bunch of entrepreneurial types here. Yeah, exactly. A side business. Yes, or or it could be my my you know my side business. That way you could pay for my writing. Mm. So, so that would be good. So. Any other? Yes. Does Rob go with you? to New York a lot I mean, on your, when you're interviewing at Fox. Oh, yeah, well he, he went with me a couple of times, but he went off and visited, he hung out with his brother, um, who lives in, in on West 79, East 79th Street, and, or we, we have some family down there, and his son lives down there too. So I went off and did my interviews, I put, um, on my two research trips, I put 30 miles on my, my Fitbit days. So I did. I'm, when I go to New York, I walk like a New Yorker. I'm just, you know, I, I rarely take the train, you know, maybe a cab at night, but I love walking Manhattan's streets, so, and just seeing how it's changed because it's constantly changing. It's a constant evolution, so, but yeah. So, anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much. It's been